Oh, hello. I'm Simon King, and this is Nature Space with Hates. And in this episode, I'm talking to Yola Williams. Uh, Yola is a Welsh naturalist and TV presenter who's worked in conservation for over 30 years. And he's most widely known as a popular member of the Spring Watch, Autumn Watch and Winter Watch team. Welcome, Yola. How are you today? Thank you very much, Simon. Yeah, very, very well, actually. Thank you. Um, I had a bit of a break over Christmas and what have you, and New Year and back to work now. So it's always nice to have that short break to recharge your battery. You know, it's going to be it's going to be long enough for you to have a rest, but not too long because I get I get quite bored very, very easily. So it's nice to be back into it again. Fantastic. Well, I hope you won't get bored today. If you do, then, you know, <laughs> tell me. <laughs> I'll just walk off. And now now I'm worried. There's a jeopardy here, which I quite like though as well. Can we start with, um, we, we were fortunate enough to spend a bit of time with Chris Packham just before Christmas. And I asked Chris, I said, what's on your bird feeder, Chris? And Chris said, well, actually, um, I, I, what I want to talk, talk about is what's not on the bird feeder as well, really, because mm. you were saying there's uh, quite a few of the usual suspects missing. But what's on your bird feeder at the moment, Yolo? Um At the moment, just, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm ashamed to say the usual suspects. It's nice to see them. Of course it is. But um, anything from cold tits, quite a few cold tits I get here. I get uh, blue tits, grey tits. Still got fair numbers of chaffinches. The green finches are coming back after a, a, a long-term decade decline due to trichomonosis, of course. So they're starting to come back, which is lovely to see. Mm -hmm. um, I get nuthatches here. I get great spotted woodpeckers. I do get the odd magpie, the odd carrion crow going after the fat balls as well. But uh, yeah, worryingly is what's not there and what was there when I first moved into this house 20 years ago now. Um, the two fields at the back of me here, I was desperate to buy because the old boy who owned them wasn't, from a farming point of view, wasn't a good farmer. From a wildlife point of view, of course, he was a brilliant farmer. And um, the meadow, not quite a hay meadow, but almost there, was full of seed-bearing plants, your, your sorrels and knapweed. And that meant that it was attracting things like bullfinches and linnets. The house, the, the two fields came up for sale about, must be best about 10 years ago now, and I was desperate to buy it, but... They went for £9,000 an acre, seven mm -hmm. acres in all. I thought, had they gone for about four, 5000 an acre, I put that on the mortgage of my house at about two fields. One I would have uh, converted into a woodland, the far one, which abuts a woodland anyway. This, the one just at the back of our house mm -hmm. kept as a hay meadow. Uh, I just couldn't afford that. Um, the farmer over the way, he's a lovely, lovely chap. He bought it, but of course he's going to make money out of it. So the first thing he did, he ploughed. He fertilised, he reseeded, and it's now nothing but rye grass. There's not a flower in the field. So the bullfinches have gone, the linnets have gone, and and, and the the kind of volume of birds has really gone down. I'm, I'm, I'm really noticing that. We used to have clouds of house sparrows here. We've still got a few, one or two nesting leaves of the house. I've got boxes up for them as well, but nowhere near what we used to have. So, yes, yeah. uh, you know, and often you hear the argument, oh, well, it's it's only one field. It's only one field, but it's a death of a thousand cuts. You know, that multiply that one field by 10,000 or that one hedge by 20,000, and they're all going and we, we, we're losing so much good habitat and so much wildlife so um yeah i'm 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 kind of ruining the fact that i didn't break the bank to buy the two fields but then i i, I would be deeply in debt it's a it's a hard one isn't it we're, we're going through a similar situation here because we've as a commercial enterprise hey so as a Burford company we're moving from where we are in grimsby we're moving to louth which is just on the edge of the lincolnshire world but we had an opportunity to buy more land than we actually needed. So we thought, what 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 would what would it, our business look like if we did if we did that? Can we afford to? Uh, and then actually, the more we looked at it, we thought we can't afford not to. Let's yeah. buy a little bit more land than we need. Let's hand it, but let's hand it back to nature. So that's actually what we're we're doing. We're it's it's our commercial space to nature, uh, and we're handing that back. So we're about twenty ish twenty five percent of our plot. So we'll be planting native species of, of trees to attract pollinators and so on we've got wildlife attenuation ponds so our drainage will be dealt with instead of putting everything under the ground we're going to have ponds and 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 hopefully yeah. we can attract more life. so we're in the, we were actually we're akin here uh, and and uh, and i um you have my uh, sympathy and empathy it's very hard to know what is the best thing to do in hindsight you know you you, you can kick yourself but 
we've we've had to make that decision as a commercial enterprise. You know, we thought we can't afford not to really because we we didn't know. Mm. Uh, we thought here's an opportunity really to put something back. We spend a lot of time telling people, well, telling, but advising people what they can do in their own garden space. And we thought we better put our, mo our money where our mouth is here. Yeah. We're a commercial yeah. business. We've got a responsibility. Let's do something about it. So perhaps the, the nice thing is, though, is, is that and one of the main reasons I was excited about talking to you today is that when, I, when I talk to many people, a lot of these things are quite anecdotal. But I know, I mean, you've been working and perhaps you can tell listeners a little bit about the work you've been doing because you, you work with the RSBB for almost 15 years. Uh, and, and, and I think going back, uh, you know, you were working with, with some of the uh, Wales' uh, rarest breeding birds. So you've you know, th this is not just something that you're spotting over a period of five minutes. You, you've got a long history of, of of being able to talk about this. Yes, yeah, and, and and you know, it always annoys me when when you you see the anti, you see the anti conservationists saying, "Ah, oh, these these people, they come from the towns and cities, they read the books, I'm going to clue what they're on about." I'm a local boy. I'm a mid Wales boy, born and bred. I grew up here. I worked on farms when I was a kid. Um, so I've seen these massive changes. I've worked on some of these massive changes. And yes, I joined the RSBB, I think it was the end of 84. I left in 98. Um, I had 15 fantastic years. I loved my work. I was what they call a species officer for whales. So it was um, divided into three main areas, really. One was species monitoring, keeping an eye on the populations of birds. How are they doing? Are they going up? Are they going down? Can we do anything about it? Or do we have to pass this information on to our research department? Um, another area was advisory, giving advice to big landowners. So it was working with people like, um, at the time, the Forestry Commission, the National Trust owned a lot of the Welsh coast where uh, birds like ch Chuff reside. You know, so that uh, wow. had to speak to them about land management to benefit some of these target species. Uh, also investigations. Um, I was a link between the investigations department at the lodge and the local police. So I was often the first point of call uh, you know some of the things that I've seen uh, are, are quite horrific and that is why when I hear about things like what's going on in Dorset at the moment uh, you know where we've lost two uh, white-tailed eagles we've had a couple of incidents recently where a lot of buzzards red kites um, uh, uh, have been found dead have been found poisoned um, and there's an apparent cover-up at the highest level there as well that's why those things disgust me because I got first-hand knowledge of how difficult it is to bring these cases to court even when mm. you've got the support of your 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 senior officers and hierarchy and when you haven't got that then it makes it 10 times more difficult so um yeah I I really enjoyed my time with the RSPB and it gave me a fantastic insight into what's actually going on in our countryside uh, and what was the turning point then? How, how did how did this career with the RSPB turn? I, 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 I'm, I don't imagine it that it was something that was premeditated. I'll spend 15 years with the RSPB, then I'll, <laughs> I'll, no. I'll you know, I'll become a, a TV presenter. So what, what was the turning point for you? When did, how did it manifest into a TV career? The, the interesting thing is um, I'm not a TV presenter at all. I, you know, I'm not. It's something I've stumbled across. And when I watch what I do compared to someone like Chris or compared to Michaela, you know, I'm looking at professionals there. I really am. Um, I never wanted to go into telly. And, and it saddens me when I see so many youngsters now who are quite keen naturalists. They say, I just want to be, I want to do your job. I want to be on TV. And my advice to all of them is do a proper job first. Yeah. You know, become a ranger, become a warden, become a conservation officer. Just get that grounding, get that knowledge and, and put your enthusiasm into a proper job first. Um, I spent 15 years, as I said, working for the RSBB. My old boss, who was a mentor in so many ways, retired. We had a new boss and a new ethos came in um, whereby I was being forced into middle management. I was told I... Uh, I'd been there nearly 15 years, 14 and a half years, and I was going to be pushed into middle management, which entailed giving up the field work, uh, working mainly from behind a desk, managing teams out in the field, uh, preparing annual reports and budgets and health and safety mm -hmm. and all that kind of rubbish. And I just said, it ain't going to happen. It's just mm -hmm. not going to happen. And the more I fought against it, the more they were trying to push me into it. 
So that was when I took the uh, decision to hand in my notice with no job to go on to. I just didn't have a clue what I was going to do. Really? Now, because of the work that I did, I had to deal with the media. Um, you know, if there had been a, a severe poisoning incident in Wales uh, and the media would say, OK, do this, I'll go and talk to Yolo. So I had to deal with the media fairly often. Um, didn't really enjoy it that much. Really. They were a pain in the backside, if I'm being honest with you. They can be very arrogant, you know, very, um, very pushy. I, I always think the media arrives at a, a nature reserve wanting to interview somebody, expecting that person to drop everything. It's all right, telly's here, you know, but it doesn't work like that. People have got jobs. People have got things they want to get on with kind of thing. So I didn't like the media at all. Um, but when I left the RSPB, there wasn't much work around. There was quite a bit of consultancy work. And at right. the time in Wales, a lot of that was uh, building wind farms, some of those in areas that I opposed, um, moorland, upland, moorland areas where we had breeding curlew, breeding merlins, skylax. Um, and I thought, well, I'm not going to sell my soul to the devil here. And offers came in from BBC Wales and um, Welsh Telly S4C. I rejected them the first time round. And then after a while, I just got married. We had a little baby, Dewi, and I thought, I'm going to have to find money from somewhere here. So then I went back to these TV companies and said, OK, let's give it a go. If you like what I do and I like working with you, great. If it doesn't work out, don't worry about it. And that now was coming up for 20, 25, nearly 26 years ago. Was it? Fantastic. Oh, and and uh, and I suppose, you know, the, it, it seems like you have a healthy respect for TV, but it, 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 have you... Have you come to peace with that, really? Because in, term, in terms of the TV presenting, uh, I, and I think I know what you mean. You know, when you when 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 you look at people like Chris, very polished, very Chris has been a TV presenter for a very long time. Um, but you have a strong passion and lots of knowledge. You've been at the sharp end of of of, of ecology. You know, you've worked the, with the RSPB. You've done your time there, and I think personally, that's what comes across. On the screen, I'm not saying that Chris doesn't, but I am saying what's interesting is is that you bring something completely different from me, and I'm and that's why I was really interested in hearing about how that landscape has changed for you. You know, either in your garden space, in and around Wales, we hear a lot about the UK, we hear a lot about Scotland, and I know Winterwatch is going to be you know talking about Edinburgh and so on. I, I understand uh, this year, but I was really interested in in Wales, you know, uh, and. and so what is that love of where, where did it where did, when did you decide to study ecology when was when did that hit the radar for you it, it, yeah it, it's an interesting question one i often get asked and there's no definitive answer it's always been there right. and some of my earliest memories are, are to do with wildlife and i mean from the age of about well maybe not three i can't remember that far back but four certainly you know i remember we had big old storage heaters in the house in Tanned in Lake Vernwy where I lived, and they they were on overnight because it was cheaper. They were off in the day. I remember sitting on those for two reasons. First of all, it warmed up my backside, <laughs> and secondly, I could look out at at the bird feeder, you know. And I remember clearly seeing a very strange looking chaffinch come into the garden one winter when we had snow, and it was my first ever brambling. Um, and and I clearly remember I remember seeing the last red squirrel in in the garden. And after that, it was just great, you know. So yes, uh, yeah. it, it, it's always been there. It was nurtured by mum and dad. They were both teachers. They were excellent, you know. They never, they never tried to bend me off um, or veer me off the path of going to work in conservation. I always knew from very, very early age exactly what I wanted to do. And if I couldn't play rugby for Wales, it was gonna be conservation. And I, I definitely wasn't good enough to play rugby for Wales. Um, and, and so they, they always encouraged that. But the, the one overriding figure in my life early on was Tide, my, my uh, grandfather. He was, we used to go up and stay there fairly often. And he was an electrician by trade, but he'd been a poacher. And bear in mind, he was born in 1880, 1888 or 1889. So he was around, he was a young lad at the time when or most of the area where he lived up in North Wales was still owned by the big landowners and you, you right. weren't allowed onto the estates, big walls there. And he used to creep on, he used to poach fish, he used to poach uh, duck and um, rabbit and pheasant just to bring food home to put on the table because, you know, food was 
had to come by. They weren't a wealthy family, not by a long mile. Um, and he passed on a lot of that knowledge to me, not just how to identify stuff, but to look at the behavior, to think about what they were likely to do next, how to find bird's nest, how to tickle fish, how to catch fish with, with my hand, um, what I could and couldn't eat, the, the plants that I could eat, digging for, for pig nuts or, or eating wood sorrel leaves, all of that kind of thing he passed on to me. And he loved having a, a young lad, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight years of age, hanging on his every word and just thirsty for that knowledge that, that he had. Yes. Do you, so you didn't really realize at that time you were learning the subtle arts of observation, field work and becoming a nature detective, really? Not, not really. No, I, mm. I, I just really, really enjoyed it. You, you know, and I loved going out with Tidy. Taught me how to fish as well. We used to go fishing as well. Yeah. Um, so it was just that thirst for knowledge and something that I was interested in. And what's interesting is that when I went up to high school, um, I really didn't like it at all. Really right. didn't enjoy high school at all. I, I'm not a, a formal education type individual. Some people mm. are good at it it's geared towards certain individuals but not to others i mm. just wanted to be outside i wanted to learn outside um and a lot of my mates were the same albeit they were farmers they didn't want to be in school because they wanted to be at home working on the farm or working yes. on the machinery or whatever it was you know so uh, it, it it's difficult with education i know we've got one education system throughout wales throughout most of england scotland as well and it doesn't, it's not a one size fits all. You know, it's never going to fit everyone. It's impossible. Of course it is. And it, it didn't really work for me. Yeah. These early formulative years, uh, one thing we talked to Chris Packham about was his, 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 his film, um, you know, his TV program, which is The Walk That Made Me. And he encounters yeah. of a, a few youngsters who are with the parents. Uh, and he talks about, you know, they're, they're, they're catching stickle bats and putting the uh, bats and putting them in, in, in a jar and so on. And it reminded, I've forgotten, but it, it reminded me I did the very same. Uh, but, you know, catching children at that at those formative years and, and not, not necessarily saying, look, do this and you will become this, but just saying, look, just enjoy this, observe. What do you, where do you think it will go next? Will it swim that way? Will it swim this way? If we put it in a jar, what might it look like? What color is its belly, you know, and so on. These are things that stick with children for life that, we may lose for a while but we come back to it don't we you know do, or, yeah or do, you, I, do you agree yes i do I, but you've got to put that seed in early yeah. and and one of the things that i i don't like seeing is that we're going away from uh, hands-on conservation but by that hands-on education by, by that i mean when i was in school every single school had an aquarium with frog spawn in it and he used to go in, used to watch you know, those little black dots become yeah. little black sausages. And yes, then all right. of a sudden you see it transform. They hatch out. Then the back legs come through. Then the front legs and the tail disappears and it becomes a mini frog. And we yes. watched all of this. And then I saw people that were not really interested in wildlife, but was to come in on a Monday morning, especially if we'd had a week off. And they was going, What's happened? And we all used to go and gaze and see how they'd change. You know, I learned my longest ever word, metamorphosis, is still the longest word I know <laughs> now. Um, but it's vitally important, I think. And I think it's important when you're going out with kids to show them how to pick things up, yes. how to handle things, but always, always, always to put them back carefully where they were and let them go. You know, I don't like this business of look, but don't touch. Yes. I think with youngsters in particular, if you can catch a newt and then turn it over and show the fiery orange belly and the pattern on there, mm. you know, they'll go, wow, look at that. But then you say, but hold it carefully, gently, and then put it back in so it can go back under the rock where it was before. It, I, I think with kids, with youngsters particularly, that is absolutely vital. It's one thing to point something out two meters away, but yeah. it's something else for them to have it in their hands and have a look at it. You know, it's it, it's it's magical. Yeah, I was I was thinking of the word respect as you were an, an appreciation, an observation. You know, as you was describing that, and I, and I think you're right. It's become quite clinical, really. I, I think you know, it was. In, you've reminded me as well of uh, I, I recently watched uh, a program with, with David Attenborough, and he was talking about his relationship with Sir Peter Scott and how how he moved from this wanting to 
capture things, you know, from wanting to actually observe them in 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 their um, you know in their place in their proper place, and yet that I don't think he would be who he is if he hadn't have gone through that process of handling them and and appreciating them and so on, and and I, and I suppose that missing from our curriculum is going to create a, a, a little bit of a sterile world if we don't address it. Is it what's what's happened then? Whose fault is that? Is it is it is it the, the is it the curriculum? Is it the government? I, I mean, I don't want us to get political, but what's what's yeah. your thoughts on the ground? I think it's a whole host of things. It's us as conservationists as as well. You know, we now poo poo all this or oh, mustn't handle it, mustn't handle it. And in most cases, I agree. You don't want to disturb for the sake of disturbing, especially um, people who are out there to film. I'm not one of these mm. say, "I'll oh, pick up the adder, get it to strike," and this that. Don't. Just show it where it is because it's a beautiful, beautiful animal. Just film it, explain why it's there, what it's doing. And if you can film that and then walk away and it's still where it was, then that to me is a massive success. But when it comes to youngsters and things that you might be able to pick up or show them how to pick up, because you know that youngsters are going to pick things up anyway. And mm. if you can teach them how to pick them up carefully, gently, properly, then how to put them back, then that mm. is going to help. I think our obsession with health and safety is a big thing, and mm. COVID won't have helped that. Everybody washing their hands every two, th three minutes. But do you know what? I wash my hands maybe once a day, maybe once a day. I'm a firm believer in I need bacteria in my mouth. Um, I remember the days when I used to go out ringing mm. gossok chicks and hen harrier chicks, and halfway through, I'd stop, wipe my hands like this on here, <laughs> eat a pasty, and then go back to handling them again. You know, and I'm still here. I'm not dead. I haven't got any bad diseases as far as I know. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so I think it's a combination of things. I think things are starting to change now. Mary Colwell has done some fantastic work. She's the curly lady. She's been campaigning for curly for years and years and years. She's managed through her constant campaigning to get um, uh, the um, natural history onto the curriculum in England. I think that's brilliant. That's absolutely mm. brilliant. We need that to change in Wales. We need it to change in Scotland, Northern Ireland as well, because it's vitally important. What we have to remember, it's all very well doing maths and doing physics and doing French and Spanish, but without our knowledge and respect of natural history and the world around us, it's not going to be any Spanish. It's not going to be any French. It's not going to be any maths. It's not going to be any physics. We're looking at what sustains life on Earth, and that includes us. And if we mm. don't respect that and look after that, there's no point doing anything else. Mm. So I, I suppose when the when when the well when the government when you when we hear that we're calling to study maths for a longer period and so on, which you know may well be important for some people, but not everybody uh, will appreciate that but perhaps you know what 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 should be part of of i think we're saying is is that what should be part of this process at least is to, for us to have a better understanding of the natural world uh and and that makes sense really and and it seems to be the, you know the more the earlier that comes the the, the more appreciative we might be and, and respect what we've got before we lose it because i mean that's i thought we, we we might we might come on to that in a, in a few moments but um uh, I can see now why uh, the producers. Every time I see you, you know, you are outside. <laughs> You're not in a TV yeah. studio. <laughs> and, no, but, no, no. But that works for you, doesn't it? it yeah, yeah, I, it does. I, I, yeah. I, I don't like. I really don't like being inside at all. You know, I'm inside now, and I'm itching to get it. I'm actually, <laughs> believe it or not, I've got a radio interview to do in about three hours. I think it is. I'm going to fit in a run along the canal between now and then. And I love going along the canal. I see kingfishers. There's always yes. a chance of seeing otters. The swans are there, you know, so so it's just getting out, just getting and, and it doesn't have to be somewhere exotic, far yes. away. Um, and every single year, I always, always, always make time to carry on doing a lot of the stuff I did in my RSPB days. I'm licensed to monitor breeding hen harriers, breeding merlin, breeding peregrines. So I still go up onto my favourite moorland areas and monitor these birds. Help a good, good old you. mate of mine to get out there and if you ask me what do I enjoy more than anything else in the world outside of family life here it's being up on the moors either on my own or with a very good mate of mine Keith offered just monitoring hen harriers merlin peregrines and whatever else is there I, I love that
really i mean even when you're you're i think i saw a, I, I know i saw a video uh, i think it was the maybe the river uh, the canal trust and so on i think you were talking about the important part that our canals play now they i guess they are they are these wildlife corridors um and so even when you're going for a run if you if you spot something you'll stop i guess will you and just yes, what's that? yes. oh yeah I'm, <laughs> I'm not one of these manic runners i've got to beat this and beat that you know look at me I, i'm an old man now you know i, I played rugby till i was 45 and i really miss it so that's why i run i don't don't enjoy the run but i do really love uh um physical challenges uh so yeah i'm up for run if i see anything like early spring is what i love sort of march time you know i'm running along canal one side big hedge this side and all of a sudden you hear the the sort of alarm of a long-tailed tit and i know when i hear that there's a nest somewhere near here and, and even going on a run five six mile run i might find two three long-tailed tit nests might find a couple of song thrushes, blackbirds and whatever. Yeah, so, you know, I'm not one of these manic, I've got to make it there and back in, in you know, 45 minutes, whatever it is, rubbish. Yeah. No, 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 I'll, I'll run. But if I see something good, I'm going to stop. So, J Yolo, just just that that point then. So let's say, what what? How do we do this? So we're we're running, we're walking, we hear something. What's your, what's your advice for us? What do we do? I mean, if, you know, just just stop, look, listen, and sometimes smell. You know, I get people saying, oh, "I haven't seen a kingfisher for years," you know, and I look at them and I say, "I'm not surprised. You got headphones on." You're out in the canal with a pair of headphones on. What are you doing with a pair of headphones on? Take those off because you're going to hear it before you see it. And I play the app on my phone so that they know what a, a, a kingfisher's long single note sort of mini whistle sounds like. Then they think, I think I heard that as well. Well, the next time you hear that, stop, just stop. Give yourself time. And the likelihood is one will come flashing past if you're lucky enough, it might land on a branch on the other side of the canal. So it's just just taking time and people say oh you know i'm not quite sure i know what i'm looking at well just mm -hmm. take time you've got apps you can download onto your phone you you hear a song you think now, is that a garden warbler is that a black cat oh i'm not sure i'm not sure well just stop and wait because the will eventually show itself and you think yeah. all right okay so that's a male black cap so that's the that song okay so if i remember that the next time you'll think i think that's a black cap and it turns out it is a black cap the next time you think I know that's a black cap. So just take time. There's no uh, secret to it. Yes, you can buy CDs. You, you, you can look at videos on your phone and all this, but there's nothing to beat spending time out in the field. And if you've got a friend or friends who are good at their plants, at their reptiles, at their bees, at their birds, whatever it is, spend time with, with them as well. Over lockdown, one of the things I really got into, not an expert, not by a million miles, is bees. Solitary bees, you know, I've, right. I've got a mini orchard. I've got a small garden here. It's it's not huge. It, we've got a bungalow and the garden is thin strip of maybe six, seven meters right around that. Well, one bit of it I've put over to a pond, one bit I put over to mini orchard. I've got nine apple trees. And in April, when the blossom comes out, it's magnificent. I've got ashy-faced mining bees. I've got red mason bees, things that four years ago, you know, I knew they were bees, but I wasn't sure which type. So it's taken me a while to get all of that information in my head. And I've learned that just by going outside with a cup of tea, just looking, watching, listening. That's great advice. I, I wanted to talk about gardens, but you, you, you've done something that, yeah, that's really helpful because I, I do the same. Bees, we've got bees, and, and, and but I don't go into it any deeper than that. So I'm going to stop, look and listen. I'll, I'll, I'll think of you when I, when I the, the first bee I hear in the garden. <laughs> well, we, hopefully, I mean, talking of, talking of bees, here it's, it's very mild. It was very mild, yeah. incredibly mild yesterday, very mild today. Uh, you, you, I know you've got uh, Winter Watch coming uh, soon for you, and I, and I understand you're broadcasting live from Edinburgh. Uh, and I think you, one of the things I read on the BBC uh, press release was that you're looking exploring the thriving urban ecosystem. So you're out in the field again, you know, <laughs> and not in the studio, but I imagine. What well, can you tell us anything about that, or is is that all secret at the moment? Still? No, it's not. No, no. A uh, couple of things that I'm going to be doing. One is I'm going to be looking at um, pollution, particularly plastic pollution in right. uh, the water of Leith, which it runs right through the heart of Edinburgh and out uh, into the sea at uh, Leith itself. I'm going out with a wonderful lady, Charlotte, there looking at uh, amazing amounts of, of plastic, you know, plastic bottles, 
um, balls, small balls people throw for their dogs, yeah. um, dozens and dozens and dozens, and over a year, hundreds of them, uh, bigger footballs, all of this. You know, people lose them, think, oh, well, it's only a ball. Yeah, but it's only one ball, but there are hundreds of them getting lost every year, mm -hmm. getting washed down, plastic bottles. I just, I wish we could tackle this mentality, this throwaway mentality that modern society has because um i run along the canal and i stop for my wildlife but i stop to pick up litter as well i mm. always take a small plastic bag with me and sometimes i can't carry everything uh, and this mm. is an area of canal that's not that well walked so it's walkers who are doing this people you'd think mm. would be know a lot more about the concern about how they should act out there but they obviously don't so um i'm going to be looking at that i'm going to be meeting a young chap who has um, real uh, bad mental health, PTSD. He was in the army, PTSD. And wildlife and otters in particular have been a massive help. It, it's given him a reason to live again. So, uh, yeah, some really uplifting tales. One or two quite sad ones as well, of course. But um, right. we, we'll also be looking at, at winter, the effects of a changing winter, something we've done for several years now. Look at, you know, what, I remember when we were up at Nethy Bridge in the Ken Gorms there, we were mm. looking at how winter's changing and the knock-on effect on things like mountain hares and ptarmigan. So, but even in urban areas, a changing winter, you know, you've got flowers out in January that mm. should have been out in July, you know, June, July time. So, yeah, things are changing very much for the worse. So it's... um. It's a worrying time, but I think as conservationists, we've got to be optimistic as well. Uh, we, we, we mustn't be all doom and gloom. There's a lot of young people out there who are quite scared by what's going on. Yeah. Um, so, yes, we must do everything we possibly can to tackle it, but we must concentrate on the good news stuff as well sometimes. Yeah. It's interesting that, that we interviewed on, on the podcast, uh, uh, because this is this is what our podcast is about. We're a birth food company, but we want to talk to people who are making a positive difference um, and, and doing the best. But we have, we've got a chap locally who who's uh, well known as the canoe river cleaner. And during lockdown, he started go, taking walks along the, 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 the river, the River Freshney, which is a chalk stream here, a very important river here. But he noticed exactly as you did. He started picking up pieces of plastic and litter and so on. And in the end, he, he actually bought a Canadian canoe so that he could oh, get wow. more rubbish out. And what was interesting, when, when we chatted to James, we also interviewed a, a, a chap called Paul Rose, who's an explorer, works with uh, yeah. National Geographic. The He's a diver, scenes. isn't he, Paul? Yeah, keen diver. Oh, you know, Paul, fantastic. Well, he's seen... What's interesting is... Um, is, is that the Canoe River Cleaner has seen the, these single-use plastics and so on here in Grimsby. Paul Rose, we talked about it in, in Antarctica, or at, at the rather, uh, uh, you know, the, the exped expedition kind of centre from there, that he was seeing the other side of it. And it turns out, you know, it's us, isn't it? It's the apex predator again. You know, the, the uh, people, we should know better. And, 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 and I know when you say that, it frustrates people because they say, well, who, you know, who, who do you think you are? But I suppose I'm somebody who doesn't, discard litter you know anywhere other than where it should be i hope and as a business we have got to be um uh, we've got to be better we've got to and i and i promised paul uh, the explorer that we would be uh, eliminating our single-use plastics so the next time i talk to him if if i haven't i'm going to be in trouble because <laughs> he's going to feed me to the polar bears <laughs> and rightly so <laughs> um but can we come back to um Mental health, because I, I I know this is something you've you've had quite a bit to do with before, really. I, th I think uh, I saw a, a video and you were talking about the benefits of of the natural world and nature and and so on. W would you talk about that? Yeah, very much. So I, I'm I'm very lucky. I, I I haven't suffered from any mental health issues personally, but I've got good friends who've gone through very very difficult times very dark times you know and it was something that mm. probably up till about six or seven years ago I was fairly unaware of or maybe I was aware of it in my periphery somewhere and thought oh well poor them and didn't think any more about it and it, it really hit home over lockdown I got a good friend who lives fairly locally to me here and his wife phoned me up and said y'all can you please phone so and so and please try and get him to come out with you because for the last two weeks he's locked himself away in his room and this is a chap that mm. you would have put money on not being affected by lockdown, not being affected by anything. 
but lockdown restricted his movements and he, he lived and breathed birds, bird ringing, wildlife, and it really affected him, really, really affected him. Right. And since then, um, got involved, you've taken him out to make sure that he did get out to, to new areas, local areas. Um, and I've got to be quite friendly with a couple of ex-army people who've got PTSD and both of them have sought uh, solace in wildlife. One is now a real expert on red squirrels up on Anglesey and a, a fantastic man. I'm sure he won't mind me mentioning his name, Hugh Rowlands. He's a lovely, lovely man, Hugh. And he takes people to see red squirrels. And, and I, I was there with him three weeks ago, sat down and we had six of them right around us, you know, not 50 meters away, but a meter, half a meter away. And and, and it, he said, these squirrels have saved my life, literally have. You know, it's not over saying things. They have saved his life. Yes. He still got PTSD, of course, but the way that yes. he manages it, the way that he overcomes it is every day he'll go and spend time in his magical place in a woodland in the center of Anglesey, and he'll go and enjoy the animals and the, the birds there. And I was really pleased a couple of years ago to see that I think doctors up in Shetland are now prescribing nature walks. You know, they give people a prescription that says, okay, you must attend this nature walk. And, and it does work. It does work. And even if you're in the middle of London, you think, well, I can't, I, you know, I can't do anything about it. Yes, you can. You'll have a park or you'll have a mm. cemetery somewhere safe. Make sure it is somewhere safe, not too far away. Go there one lunchtime, sit for 15 minutes with a cup of tea. And again, just look, just listen, just smell. Every now and again, close your eyes and just take a deep breath. It does help. Watch a little gold crest as it's looking for spiders and insects in amongst the ivy. Just, just watch it. Just watch it. You know, if a fox comes through or a deer comes through, you never know what you're going to see. Nine times out of ten, it won't be anything special, maybe. But every now and again, it will be. And that will lift you. And then you'll recharge your battery. You'll be able to face going back into the office. So, yeah, it, yeah. It, it's something very, very close to my heart. But as I say, touch wood, I've been very lucky. I'm really lucky. And I suspect it's because I spent so much time out and about that I don't get affected by mental health issues. Yeah, that's fascinating. And you're so right. I, I was looking out of our, um, our, our house. I think I was in the in the bathroom. I think I looked down and the floor looked like it was moving. And and I, th I had to reach my glasses. I'm, I'm at that stage, got to get the glasses on. And and actually it was, it, there were red wings everywhere. Wherever I looked, it was just in amongst the leaves. It was amazing. But it took me a while to fathom it out, what was actually happening. But it looked like the ground was moving. But, you know, you don't, we don't need red wings. It could be the simplest thing. In fact, the contrast in a city, in an urban setting, just, you know, seeing a squirrel, a fox, you know, so can, can actually be uh, just, just, and they're there, aren't they? They are there. Yeah. They're not only they there when there. you look. <laughs> they're there all the time. Yeah, that, they are. And, and uh, you know, the urban birder, David Lindo, he's fantastic at, at bringing people's attention in the middle of London. I think London's got something like 25 pairs of peregrines. It might be more than that now. You know, this is London. This is our biggest sort of city, huge area. But there are peregrines in there. How exciting is that? We know there are foxes, there are badgers in there, parts of the periphery. You've got deer there. So it, it is, it just needs people to stop, to look yes. and to listen yeah. just every now and again. That's all it needs. Yes. And and, um, and again, one of our podcast guests was uh, is from was from the Institute of Zoology, and Natalie was talking about rewilding, urban rewilding, and the benefits of it. You know, for, to to actually reduce the worst of of uh, climate change and biodiversity loss and so on. So actually, there's a chance that we could have even more wildlife in our in our urban settings, which would be great, wouldn't it? Really? Yeah, ve very much so. And I saw some facts and uh, figures last summer when we had the incredibly hot weather. Uh, about the, the degrees by which trees bring down temperatures in a lot of these urban areas. And I know people say, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, but the roots are an issue, blah, blah, blah. Well, the roots might be an issue. You can overcome that. You cannot overcome the fact that the temperature is warming up and it is killing people. It is literally mm -hmm. killing people. If you can have these shaded avenues, it helps a phenomenal amount, especially where you've got... Yes. Uh, nursery schools, primary schools, secondary schools. If you can plant trees, if you can sacrifice some of those huge green areas that are, let's be honest, not much is done with those. If you can plant uh, 
flower beds there to help our pollinators. If you can plant trees, okay, they, they're not going to be mature for quite some time, but they will provide shade for youngsters to go underneath. It, it will help and it'll help the planet overall as well. Yeah, and, and, and it's a... It's not good enough, is it, really, to say, well, it will take too too long. You know, the old, no. when, when was the best time to plant a tree? You know, but, yeah. you know, yeah. the second best is today. Because it, we, someone has got to, and, I, and, and perhaps this is the problem with our, um, with our um, members of parliament. You know, they, they, they have a three, four, five year, whatever, shelf life. So but we, we need them to make decisions that last. Uh, and, and, and I suppose, or, or at least to, to help, enable us you know if, if we yeah. say these are the things we we want to happen to at least en enable those things to happen i suppose they're, they're not waking up and deciding that they'll this will happen we have to say this is what we want to happen please you know and, and, and you know make help that to to happen for us y you seem really upbeat about this and yet i know i know also or won't seem you you, you are upbeat and, and and you remind me of when I watch um, David Attenborough at the end of his show, and I've, we've talked about figures of population declines and climate change and so on, and at the end he always says, "Look, I'm hopeful. You know, I'm hopeful," mm -hmm. and and that seems to be where you are. But and yet, you know, I, I also um, have access to things like the State of Nature report. I know in my own garden, and as a kid, I remember uh, it's anecdotally, but I, you know, I, I remember house sparrows. I remember they're just not there in in, in the same volumes and so on what you know what's going what's going wrong what are, what are the uh, what are the biggest challenges that we face and, and how can we address them how can we keep being upbeat cool that that would take uh, days not just hours to answer um sorry <laughs> uh, no 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 uh, it, it is difficult and, and i think uh, there are so many answers i could give you you know yeah. but um uh the politics at the moment. I mean, we've got the worst government of my lifetime at the moment. I, I absolutely detest them with a passion. I really do for what they're doing to the environment, to the country. Um, but I, I think putting other things aside, one of the big things we as cons conservationists have to do is learn how to get the message across to the 80 odd percent of people whose main concerns are how do I put a roof over my family's head? How do I keep paying the heating? How do I pay for the food? Can I pay next month's water bill? You know, we need to get the message across that those are vital. Of course, those are absolutely vital. But just as important as you having clean, fresh water, clean air. And to do all of that, we need to look after the world around us, the environment, the seas, the rivers, uh, the trees, the uplands, the lowlands. We need to look after. Yes, we have to produce food. Of course we do. But we need to respect wildlife and nature and the various ecosystems all around us. And I think it's only when we get that message across to the 80% of the people mm. who either don't care or don't know or have other um, priorities, it's only then, I think, that we will win. And education is a big part of that. Yes, it is. Mm. But, you know, education, not just in schools and colleges, but education at home as well. It, it's I think we need to get that 80 percent or whatever it is on side. Then things will change. Massive things will change. And I think it's important for people like yourself and me, Chris Packham, people like that to remain positive. Yes, we need to give Mm. the a true accurate message across but you've got to remain positive if, if we were all there saying listen do what you want because there's no point there's no point yes. anymore yeah. just trash everything throw your litter everywhere that will get us absolutely nowhere absolutely yeah. nowhere and what kind of a message is that to give to youngsters coming through now just about to set out into the big wide world thinking right okay the world's my oyster here i go don't bother there's no point don't bother you know, we, we can't have that. We've got to give, well done, you brilliant. It's nice to see young, enthusiastic, energetic people getting out and about. And one of the things that's given me more hope, I think, than anything else is the fact that a lot of the big changes over the last three, four, five years have been driven by young people. Mm. A lot of them have. And that has lifted my spirits no end, no end. You know, and I think a lot of the youngsters, 16 to 21, 25, far more intelligent than people my age, 
because they can see what's happening to the world. And, mm. and uh, I, I'm, I'm quite hopeful that we will, before long, see pretty big changes. I think you're right. It, it's, it would be quite chilling, wouldn't it, really, to say? And sometimes it reminds me of when my, uh, when my children, you know, we've been this classic one, you're in the supermarket, somebody trips up and, and they look at you before they respond. You know, have I, yeah. have I hurt myself? They're, they're kind of looking at you and, you and you try to smile. Oh, you know, and you're OK. And, and then they're fine. You know, if, and, and yet there's been times where they have hurt themselves. And, 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 and if, but if you show them that, they are suddenly, you know, it, it, they're more afraid than they were before. So I think we've got to be, uh, we've got to use the science. Um, but, but there is as much science now saying that spending time with nature is good for us. It's good for our, uh, you know, it's good for us. Uh, it's good for our mental health. So, but there's also as much science saying that, uh, that certain uh, bird populations, sparrows, swifts, and so on, you know, are, are in are in free fall. You know, so we, we've got to we've got to accept that. But I th I, I think you're right. You know, we, we we've got to be. We mentioned rugby. You, you we've we've got to feel that we can come out and and we can give it our best shot. You know, we might be we might not be the best team, but you know, we're we're going to play with our heart, and and that's where. You know that's 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 what I take from you. I, I took that on the screen, and I'm taking it now on the podcast as well. <laughs> that's what comes across. But uh, I mean, there must be challenging days, though, where you think, you know, uh, what, what what do we do? And but who who do you look up to now? I think you mentioned you mentioned your grandfather, and mm. and but who who do you look up to now? Who's Oof, yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, I, I have a, a great deal of admiration, as as most people do, for. Sir David Attenborough, of course, you know, he, he, he has brought um, the natural world to more people on this earth than anyone ever. Um, I, I, I have a huge amount of respect for uh, Chris Packham. Um, I, I'd like to count him as a, as a good friend, but he's a very private individual. So uh, outside of the watches, you know, we hardly ever meet, hardly ever meet. Um, even if I'm down his way, I don't phone him because I know he's busy, he's a private individ individual, he likes his own time, likes his time with his dogs. Um, but I admire, I really admire the way that he campaigns. He yeah. has a lot of hate, a lot of hate. So many people, he's, he's a bit like Marmite, you know, people either love him or hate him. Um, and he has a lot of hate, but he, he overcomes that and he plows on and, and continues to campaign for good in the natural world. So I have huge admiration for Chris. Mm -hmm. Um and, and yeah, there, there are so many people, but my, my world is a very different world. You know, people think, oh, he's on telly. Oh, wow, you know, he mixes with superstars and he does this and he does that. No, I don't. I live in mid Wales. My best mate is a plasterer. My other best mate is a farmer. One is a shopkeeper. And, and one of the things I'll tell you a short thing. One of the things I love about living here is uh, it must be a while back then because I had both dogs then. And I was walking down the lane here and hammer over the way. He's the one who bought the land here. Um, and his dad, Glyn, he's quite a, a quiet individual, doesn't talk much, comes over as being quite quite miserable, you know, but he isn't really <laughs> once you get underneath that. I've and got him in my down, mind. <laughs> oh, he's, he's a good man. And he, he was going down the lane in his mule, little truck, and he was going like this. And, and he never stops to say hello, never. And he, he stopped cut the engine, opened the door, looked at me, saw you on telly last night. And then that's it, doesn't say en anything else. And I thought, well, but better say something here. I said, all um, oh, right, what did you think? Did you enjoy it? And he looked me in the eye and he goes, not really. And then just <laughs> shuts the door, gets the engine going, and off he goes, you know. And I love that. I love that. Yeah, so so uh, that that is my life. You know, I, I don't mix in, the, in 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 TV circles at all. I'm 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 a country Midwilian country boy, born and bred, and always will be. The, the funny thing is, I think some people would be offended by that, but I, 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 I kind of, I can see that for you, that's just as, it's as welcome <laughs> as anything else, isn't it, really? It is. 
it, it's brilliant. It's lovely yeah. when people come up to you, you know, and say, oh, listen, I love watching you on this or that. It's lovely, of course, it is lovely. Yeah. But I really like that because it's a very honest assessment, you know, from <laughs> Glenn, my neighbour here. And, and I, I was laughing long after he'd gone, you know. He's a, and, and, and he is, he, he, deep down, he's, he's a lovely man. He, he likes to moan about this, that and everything, you know. But I, I just pull his leg and he's, he's, a, he's a really nice man. I love that story. Uh, it's Chris was really Chris Packham was really honest about. I wanted to we, I wanted to talk to him about about autism as well because this 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 there is no grey as Chris says. You know when we ask him and it was interesting actually when you, you, you you've said he's a friend and I was gonna I was gonna ask you whether whether you ask him how he is in the morning because he said that you you know his colleagues have learnt to not to ask him that question because for Chris he can only answer that question in full which could be yes. that he hadn't slept very well, his vitamins had done this and so on. And I yeah. thought, well, actually, it, but isn't it interesting because when you understand that about Chris, you can understand where that drive and passion is. If, if he feels that this is how it is and, and he's seen the research, he's seen it with his own eyes, you know, like you, you know, I can read these things in the paper and, and sometimes when they're on the news, they'll say, you know, this this is, might be an upsetting scene of this bird of prey that's been poisoned and so on. And, and people look away. You've you've seen that bird of prey. You've seen, yeah. you know, these wildlife crimes and so on firsthand. So you can't look away. And, and, and actually, it's a good thing that people like you and others don't look away because, you know, we've got to be held accountable, haven't we, and responsible for what, what we do. But, you know, I'm also aware that these things create, uh, as you say, a, a lot of problems for Chris because he, he won't look away. Um, no. And understanding where he comes from, which he's got to answer the question. You know, once once we ask him a question, he can't not answer the question because it, it's there. We've asked yeah, you, you, you have to remember with him as well is you need to understand what he's had to overcome um from being a young lad he was different nobody knew at the time why he was different now we know he's been diagnosed he's got um autism aspergers as well um and for him for anyone suffering from aspergers their natural thing is to shy away from people from mm. crowds from any situation which they're not comfortable with he's had to overcome all of that Mm. He's had to overcome it to such an extent that he'll walk out in front of a couple of thousand people and give a presentation, you know. And I think anyone who can do that is a very special mm. individual. And I tell you how amazing he is. He's the best person I know who has got a very scientific brain. Mm. He can assimilate all this complex information and then he can explain it back in a way that even a simpleton like myself can understand exactly what he's saying. He's very good at that. He's the best one I've ever met, I think, at doing that. He can explain something extremely complex, but because he has this amazingly wired brain, he can explain that even to me. And my brain can't cope with much. And genuinely, I'm not, I'm not putting myself down. I have not got the kind of brain that can assimilate you know a lot of data and then write it down summarize it but he can and he can do it in 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 an incredibly clear way yeah it it, it is an art isn't it you know when, when you watch a musician you they make it look so simple that you feel like you could pick it up and give it a go and but it doesn't sound the same a violin does not sound <laughs> the same in my hands as it does you know and so on but yeah i i think you, you know you mentioned and I, and I think this is your I think this is the the challenge that, that you, people like yourself and Chris have. You know, you 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 are um, you are taking this information. You're finding the best way of, of 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 presenting it to us, so that we don't become disillusioned, but also we 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 see some of the truth as well. And mm. I and I think that communication. That's you mentioned before. We've got to find ways to communicate this, so we can we can help people understand. And a company like ours, a commercial company like like ours. We've got to show people the way. This is what we can do in a commercial setting. Um, that's that's not fall about fall out about the fact that we've got to we've got to be a, a business. You know, we need businesses, we need industry, we need manufacturers, mm -hmm. but we've got to become cleaner. We've got to become better. Not only for, uh, I, I mean, some of the some of our plans to move also in, in, involve 
our teams here. So, for example, just to, just to um, I don't want this to turn into an advertising campaign for us, but for example, our canteen has a jetty which goes over a pond so we can open the doors, our team, and they can take a break, not just with yeah. nature, but, you know, in this, over this pond. And they can, you know, if they if they want to, you know, get a glass jam jar out in their in the, in the lunch break or whenever during the day, if they want to sit and write a blog or an article, do it, you know, with nature. Uh, and, and, and this is happening on a, it's an industrial estate. That's the other thing we're, we're going to do. That we're not taking some some you know green belt somewhere. We're, we're doing it on an industrial estate that's been designated for our for you know who our business is, uh, and and that's what we're really proud about. I'm not going to take a great deal more of your time because you've not disappeared yet, Yola. So I'm, I'm doing all right, <laughs> but I don't want to push my luck. What what uh, you, you, when the weather does change and, and, and it is changing? What's your advice? Just a few inspirational tips. What do you think? Uh, our listeners should be doing in the gardens what they could, could they be doing you know, in terms of habitat feeding the birds um one thing we've talked about is is, is cleaning those bird feeders and i think that, that will probably be a theme on on, on winter watch as yeah. well what's yeah. your thoughts uh, anyone listening to this what can they do really over this winter period just to well, right okay I, I mean i would imagine most people are, are not going to be avid gardeners some people will be of course so i would start simple start simple just um, if you haven't got a pond, either dig a little pond. It's an easy thing to do with mm. a sort of sheeting, plastic sheeting, whatever. Just dig a little pond or just get an old um, bin top, uh, anything like that. Turn it over, fill it with water, put a, bits of turf around the outside. Make it look like a little mini pond. If that works well, then put another one or dig a bigger pond. A pond is one of the best things you can have. For the wildlife that's in there, you'll get all kinds of invertebrates, but you'll get things like uh, newts, maybe even frogs and toads uh, as well. But it's it's vital water for a whole host of wildlife as well. Leave messy little patches. Now, one of the worst things about gardens that I see is that people are obsessed with tidiness, obsessed with it. Sometimes to the extent where they'll cover it with concrete or even worse, plastic grass. Never, mm. ever, ever touch that in dreadful stuff um try and leave it the wild patches leave an unmown patch and if it brings you pleasure leave a bigger one the the next year my garden here i sort of mow little paths but the rest of it i leave and i mow the paths for two reasons allow me access onto areas but also it encourages the growth of clover clover love fairly mown not tightly mown but fairly well mown areas Bird's foot trefoil is another one that likes mm. those areas. This beautiful, um, another name for it is bacon and eggs, because when the flower comes through, it's a lovely brownie red and yellow. And the bees and the butterflies love that. But then the unmown areas later on is full of yarrow and knapweed and all these things. So I've got a nice little mix there. Also, um, if you've got to trim the hedge or whatever, leave the branches in a big pile in the corner. In my pile, I've got hedgehogs. I've got hedgehogs. I know they're in there because I put a camera trap up and I watch them go in and out and in and out. And it, it's fabulous. I wouldn't have them if it wasn't for that pile of branches and bits of mown grass in the corner. I haven't dug in there, but I bet if I dug in, I'd find all kinds of invertebrates. Mm -hmm. so, so just don't be obsessed with tidiness. You might not have a big garden. There's something everyone can do because there's a simple stuff like putting out food. Put out food for... Uh, for birds, for wildlife, you can put up boxes, nesting boxes for your birds. You can put out a box for your hedgehog, although that usually costs a bomb. So I would just put a pile of twigs. That's just as as good. Um, and also you can put out uh, boxes for solitary bees. And they are fascinating when you get your, your mason bees and your leaf cutter bees using these. They are fascinating things. They, they really are. So, you know, it depends on how big your garden is, how mobile you are how much time you've got but everybody can do something and what you should never do is do nothing i love that yeah that's brilliant advice and and and, and absolutely don't whatever you do don't do nothing this is not one of those times i mean observe great but get stuck in there i mean nature loves that yeah but not but the the cleaning thing is you know we have become a little bit you know, too clinical in our, well, not a little bit. We're too clinical in our gardens. Let's get some. Let's give some space back over to nature. I think that yeah. that makes sense. You know, we, we, 
Is there anything, you, you know, the floor's yours, anything you would like to summarize, anything you want to, you know, leave us with, some inspirational, uh, that, that uh, a bit of a rally cry to get out there, whatever, the, the floor's yours. Yeah, just just simple, really. You, you know, I, I get youngsters ask me, oh, what advice can you give me? And I can try and think about something deep to say and work hard and listen to your parents and do this and do that. I'm, I'm now 60. I've just turned 60. And what you realize when you turn 60 is life is very short. So what I would say is get out there, do what you can to help wildlife and more than anything else, enjoy yourself. Fantastic. We'll do that. And I'll, and just, just to remind our listeners, you'll be uh, on Winter Watch later this month. Uh, good luck in Edinburgh. I, I, shall be, I shall be thinking about you out in the field again. <laughs> Simon, sure that... Ed Edinburgh is ideal. There's a lot of wildlife there, which I will love. But it's also got beer, whiskey and <laughs> curry houses as well. So I'm going to be a happy man up in Edinburgh. And cake, of course. Plenty of cake too. Wonderful and great. People. Well, uh, all, all the best. Good luck to you. As well. And thanks for taking time to talk to us on Nature Space with Hates. And uh, we, what we'll probably do is when we when we do move, uh, we're moving probably March, um, late March, mm -hmm. maybe early April. Uh, I'll, I'll send you a few notes so you can see what we've done and then you can hold us to account. Because if I if I haven't delivered what we said we would, well, you know, then maybe I'll pay the next bar bill or something like that. <laughs> Fantastic, Simon. You're on. I'll take up and th thank you for making time for me as well. That's really kind of me. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Take care.